Good morning. Good morning. Uh, when I go to school every morning, I listen to uh, David Jeremiah on the radio because when I leave at 7, he's what's on WJSO. And I try and listen to him every morning. And a while back, he did a, a series, and I heard the sermon I'm about to tell you. So it is kind of stolen, but I added my own stuff to it that makes it relevant to us and to me. And really, this is more for me than it is for you, but I hope it's for you too. And today I'm going to be talking about us being living sacrifices for God. And you know, our culture today is, I would say, infected with laziness and apathy. You know, every time someone doesn't do anything and you, you ask them why, they'll say, well, I don't care. Or, I don't have time to. I have to do something else. And unfortunately, that way of thinking has infected the church, Christians. I mean, every time you, you turn around, there's a Christian who's just sitting there and not doing anything. Not serving, not spreading the gospel, not help, volunteering in church, not volunteering their time for God. And you ask them why, and they say, well, I don't have the time to. And that's not okay. That is not a situation any of us should be in. Too busy to serve God? That's when you get into some trouble. And so today, I'm going to be in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. And I hope you'll follow along with me as I read this. And this is a, a famous chapter because it talks about a Christian's commitment to Christ, to God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you will present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for every blessing you have ever given us. We especially thank you for our ability to worship you in our country, freely. Lord, we know that many Christians are unable to do this, and this is a true blessing. Lord, I pray that you will be able to give me the ability to plant the seed of your word into, into our hearts, and you'll give the increase. Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray, and amen. So verse 1 begins with, a weird word to us, and that's the word beseech. This word beseech. You know, other Bible translations, if you have them, will we'll, we'll call it I urge, or replace it with I, I plead. But the original Greek word is parakaleo. Parakaleo, that's the original Greek word we translate it from. And para means beside, and kaleo means to call. So literally, this word means to exhort, to urge, to call. And Paul uses parakaleo 54 times in all of his letters to the churches. 54. And we didn't know that's really important because when Paul says parakaleo, what he means is, I am not over you. I'm giving you a suggestion that you should follow this. I'm urging you. I am being your counselor to tell you that you should, you really need to do this. Because remember, Paul is just as good as these people in these churches. He's not any better. He's just a little bit more seasoned, though. So, but we know that Paul is, well, by him saying parakaleo, he is being a counselor instead of a commander. And, and next, look at how he urges the churches. By the mercies of God. Paul is expressing that because God shows us mercy, we're supposed to show mercy in everything we do and to our neighbors. And remember, mercy is not getting something you do deserve. Not getting something you do deserve. And what we do deserve is death and not being buried six feet under the ground. I'm talking eternal, eternal, forever and ever, there is a Latin term, and it's called ad infinitum. It's Latin. Uh, scientists used it to describe infinity. That's where we get the word infinity from. Ad infinitum. And that means forever and ever and ever. 
But we deserve eternal separation from God. But God showed us mercy, didn't He? Because He gave us a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus was the embodiment of God as flesh. And He lived a perfect life, but He was tortured, beaten, humiliated, and killed for us. Now, the mercy didn't stop there because we know three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. He rose from the grave. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Back in the Old Testament days when they had to sacrifice animals, we know that God commanded them to do sacrifices. But there's something more important that God wanted from the people. He wanted their obedience. He wanted their obedience more than them to go and sacrifice these animals. And we know this to be true because in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, it makes it really clear. It says, So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God wants us to be living sacrifices. And I can hear some of you say that that's kind of an oxymoron, a living sacrifice. We are supposed to give all of our time, all of our energy to God. He wants us to put all of our stuff to Him and use it at His disposal. And the next thing it says is Christians should not be conformed to this world. Should not be conformed to this world. And this is where Christians seem to have their biggest problem. Separating themselves, the God that is in them, the Spirit of the Lord inside of them, and separating it from the rest of the world. Because you know what the, the world is full of? Pleasure, hatred, envy, greed, <laughs> violence, and apathy. I mean, it's, it's sad, but it's true. This, this, the evils of this world, the sin of the world, and, that, and it's, I know it's still hard to get over some of these things, but, but when we ignore it, and we talked about it in Sunday school, if you don't come to Sunday school, I really urge you to. It, it's really good. But when you ignore these things that are sin, and you just let them keep going, and you just don't care about them, they end up becoming more of a problem than if you actually took, <laughs> said something about it in the beginning. And we know that our culture is fueled on all of that stuff. But it must be planted in our minds to be transformed. To be transformed. We must not show it in our behavior, but also that every time we are thinking, we have to be thinking of the will of God. It can't just be our actions. It has to be inside of our brains. We have to think it. There has to be a transformation. There's a Greek word. It's metamorphosis. And in biology, we use that to describe a change from one thing to the other. But in the Greek, its definition would be a change from inside out. A change from inside out. It's the same word when they describe Jesus going up to heaven. They use the word metamorphosis. And in biology, we know that when we talk about metamorphosis, the first thing we think of is a caterpillar and a butterfly. We know a, a caterpillar starts off, it's green, little, fuzzy, it eats plants. But it turns into a butterfly by going through metamorphosis. It comes into a cocoon, right? And we know you can tell a distinct difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly because one is green and the other thing comes out a completely different color and most of the time they're really beautiful. You can see the beauty radiating away from the butterfly. And that transformation has to be visible in us as Christians. They have to be able to look at us before and look at us after and say, man, there was something different happened in that person. Because if there isn't, 
Well, you might not have been through metamorphosis. You might not have been transformed. And you have to assess your life. You have to make sure we are transforming. You have to go through metamorphosis. Because when people look at you in your butterfly stage, they need to see God radiating out of you. And if they don't, you might be in more trouble than you think. Christ's glory and His mercy has to shine out of us. In Romans chapter 12, it goes on in verse 3, and it says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Don't get me wrong, a healthy self-esteem is important because some of us don't think too little of ourselves. But we also get into a problem when people think too highly of themselves. Listen, we all need to know that God gave each of us something to do in His plan. He gave everyone something to do. So there's no need to boast about yours being more important than someone else's because God gave each of us our own thing to do. Our own gift. His own plan for us. We need to know that our gifts are not about us. It is about the grace of God letting us have those gifts. Because we need to know that God does not need you. He doesn't. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. You know, really, some of us might think we're a lost cause, or we were at one point. There is no need for God to put you in His plan of salvation, to be able to put you in His will. There's no need, because He can do it. Because if He's able to create the entire universe in six days, then He doesn't need you. There's nothing you can provide for Him. But we know that He shows grace. Grace. He gives us something we don't deserve. He gives us grace. And we need to understand that our gifts are given through grace. Our gifts are given through grace. 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 5 reads, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submi submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The next thing we need to recognize is our need for service. Because God has gifted us to do something. You know, I can hear some of us now. I don't know. Uh, do I really have a gift? Uh, I don't think this is about me. I, I just don't really know. Let me tell you, the person who just now said, I don't think this sermon is about me. This is about you. It is about you. It's about all of us. Every single person in this room has a gift given to them by God. And God has a purpose for you to use that gift. And if you're not using it, we'll keep reading. I'll keep going on. So how many of us in here have a gift? All of us. We all have a gift. And Ephesians 4, uh, verse 7 reads, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. God through His grace, has given us a plan on His earth. He has. And our plan on this earth is part of His plan. So we know that God does not need us. He doesn't need us. But through His love and His grace, He gave us a purpose. He gave us a gift. And verses 4 and 5 read, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. The church is not an organization. It's an organism. It is a living, breathing function that is an organism. It's not an organization. It's not it is a group of Christians that all have the same spirit. We know that the body 
is the illustration that Paul is using here to describe the church. And we know the body is made up of, of different parts. Uh, I read somewhere that there are over 37 trillion cells in the body. 37 trillion different individual pieces that make up you and me. That's a lot. And to put that in perspective, if you look down at your Bible and see, you see the letter O, there's over 10,000 cells can fit in your little letter O. 10,000. They're so microscopic, so tiny, but each one of them serve a purpose. Each individual cell serves a purpose. And we need to understand that each of us are a part of the body of Christ. Each of us. We are each a part, and we know what happens when one part of our body stops working. We notice. If we're sitting there and our arm disappears, we're going to know. And we also know in the, in, in the body when, when something stops working. When we get a blood clot and our heart keeps pumping... Another part of the body is saying, I'm not getting any oxygen, I'm in pain, and you start having problems. And your brain gets sent a signal, and it sends it to your heart, and it tells your heart you have to beat harder, and you have to get beat faster. And either the blood clot will keep going, it'll push it through, or you will have a heart attack. Or, we know if a, a nerve ending, or a nerve stops working, you can become paralyzed or lose feeling. So when, and that's just one individual nerve cell coming from the brain. If it stops working, you can be paralyzed. So when one part of the body doesn't work, someone else in the body is getting affected by it. So when us as the body of Christ in the church, when one of us isn't using our gift, someone else in the church is getting affected by it. We have to know that when we are serving the Lord, God is going to put things in our life and put people in our life that we are supposed to touch and we're supposed to affect because that is how God works. We are God's hands. I had a story that in World War II, there was a cathedral in Europe that had been bombed. And the Nazis had bombed it and this, this statue in this church lost its hands of Jesus. It was his arms wrenched uh, out and its hands were gone. And it was a group of college students wanted to fix it, and they couldn't figure out how to put hands on it. So they just didn't worry about it, and they just changed the inscription down at the bottom, and it says, Jesus has no hands but our hands. No hands but our hands. And that's the truth. Because when one individual of our church, and not just our church here, but the church as a whole, across the entire globe, the followers of Jesus Christ, do not do their part, someone else gets affected. When one of us is called to be a teacher, to be a preacher, to sing, to go out in the community and, and evangelize, when one of those people, just one, doesn't do it, that means uh, one person or more is not going to hear the gospel and learn what they're supposed to learn. That means that person may not ever get another opportunity. And hopefully God is more merciful and show His grace and love and give that person another opportunity because we didn't do our job. You know, the person that God put in your life for you to teach and preach to, you didn't get to. That should bother us if, if this morning we don't feel like we're serving. If we're not using our gift for God. First Corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 through 6 read There are diversities of gifts but the same spirit there are differences of ministries but the same lord and there are diversities of activities but the same god who works all in all If you want to be a growing Christian this morning you need to figure out what your gift is and you need to start using it. We need to start using it as a whole. 
We need to start serving the Lord because we need to understand that when we do not use our gift for the Lord, someone else in the body of Christ is not getting the ministry they need. Just one person. Verses 6 through 8 read, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives liberality, and he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Are you using your gift today? And I can hear wheels turning, thoughts thinking, well, maybe, uh, well, I mean, I'm not that worthy. I, I mean, I've done this and I've done that, and I don't feel like I'm ready for, to serve God because in the condition I'm in. Let me tell you something. God is not waiting for you to be perfect. Because if he's waiting for you to be perfect, then he might as well just forget about it because we're not going to be. And another thing is, is, well, I don't, I'm not talented enough to do all these different things. Well, let me tell you, we all, not one single person here, has every gift. Though some of us think we do, we don't. We don't. God is not waiting for you to be perfect, and I'll show it to you. I'm going to tell you uh, some of the people in the Bible who God used and some of the things they did. You know, Mo Moses stuttered. Noah got drunk, Gideon was afraid, Abraham was too old, Jeremiah and Timothy were too young, David had an affair and was a murderer, Elijah was suicidal, Isaiah preached naked, Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow, Job went bankrupt, John the Baptist ate bugs, Peter denied Christ, the disciples fell asleep while praying, the Samaritan woman was divorced more than once, Zacchaeus was too small, Paul was too religious, Timothy had an ulcer, and Lazarus was dead. God can use you this morning. He is not waiting for you to be perfect. He's waiting for you to be willing. He's waiting for you to be willing. All we need to do right now is say, Lord, I am willing, I am available to do your work. And if you're not... I hate to see the day when God says, listen, I called you to do this and you did not do it. And let me tell you what happened. There's a, there's a theory, it's called chaos theory, and it says that, you know, if a butterfly f doesn't flap its wings in one spot, that a hurricane can appear on the other side of the earth. It's really weird. It's, it makes sense, though. When one little domino falls and it goes down the line, I mean, we can see it. When one thing doesn't happen that God planned for you to do, your row of dominoes don't fall. And the people you're supposed to be around don't come into your life. The people you're supposed to preach, you uh, give the gospel to, don't come into your life. The joy from serving God doesn't come into your life. And I'll tell you this morning that other than my salvation, being able to wake up every morning and say that I can preach the word of God is a, it's a good feeling. It's a satisfying feeling. In the New Testament, it talks of 19 different gifts. And I'm not saying that there aren't just 19 gifts in the Bible. They may only talk of those in the New Testament. But in today's time, I mean, it's a gift to be able to work a computer sometimes. I know my dad thinks so. But it is. I mean, we, there are certain gifts that, you know, being able to use the computer, I mean, we use it every Sunday for the Lord Using that gift is a good thing. Or being able to take pictures or film videos or make movies. I mean, we see that ministry. Uh, television ministries. I mean, uh, people even like uh, the people on Duck Dynasty. I mean, think about how many of the people that they were able to give the gospel to because they decided to become on TV because they used their personality. You know, God has given each of us a different personality a different life, and a different gift. He makes us all different, and we're all special. I want everybody to say that with me. I am special. 
I am special. Because you are. Because God has gave, given each of us a purpose in this life. And it's our decision to go into that, to use that purpose, to use the gifts that God gave you, or to not. And when you don't, you're not growing as a Christian. You're not. And I'm not saying you have to work to go to heaven. I'm saying you work because God showed you mercy and you grace. If God went out of his way to come to this earth and die on the cross so you can go to heaven, surely to goodness you can get up and you can go and serve the Lord. You can tell someone about how he's changed your life. You can tell someone that he saved you from your sins. In closing, I want us to think about the gifts God gave us. And if you don't know your gift this morning, I encourage you to sit down in a quiet space and pray to God and ask Him to reveal it to you. Or go and look up the 19 that are in the Bible to set up, you know, compare what you think you're able to do to those in the Bible. I want to move this uh, comparison to the church and I'm going to say that even in this church, I see it, you have a couple people working and a bunch of people sit on the bench. I mean, it's just like basketball. You got 10 people on the court and the whole team on the bench. You got... Ten people on the court who need rest, and you got the rest of the team on the bench resting. God did not give you the purpose to be a spectator. No one is a spectator. No one. That is not your talent if you think it is to watch it go, to watch it happen. God did not give you, did not save you for you to sit there. I'm gonna ask you this morning: are you playing or are you resting? Are you on the bench or are you on the court? And that is a real decision, a real question you need to answer right now. And you either need to say, I am ready to serve right now, or eh, I'll think about it. Because when you say, eh, I'll think about it, right there is the devil popping into your mind, and then boom, he's caught you right there. If you do not make the decision at this moment, right here, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And as I close and we have our invitation, I want us to think about that during our invitation and we're praying. And you know, this invitation is for people who are lost and want to come to the Lord, but <laughs> listen, it's also for us that are Christians that, this is prayer time, for us that are Christians that say, listen, Lord, I am ready to serve, I am ready to go, let's get started. I've, I've started my car, it's heating up, I'm ready to go. So as we all stand and have our invitation this morning, I want us all to think of that. Are we on the court or are we on the bench?